All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is gr uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share some of my work with you. Um, I have 150 slides, so we're going to go fast through this because it's 40 minutes, and I believe in punctuality. So let's do it. Um, I always start with this slide because, um, as an editorial designer in um, in the U.S. You just work a lo lot of long hours. You're always, you know, running against the um, clock. You're trying to put magazines together uh, I every two weeks, and um, it takes a lot of coffee, a lot of coffee to get you going and keep you focused. Um, this is, um, I don't know, this is really low contrast, so some of you guys not, uh, may not be able to see it. But um, I recently bought a new typeface from Typefonderie, <laughs> and this is a little shout out. And it's also, um, it has my whole name on it, which is actually Claudio Zario Marquez de Almeida. Uh, in the US, I go by Claudia de Almeida because it's hard enough to get Americans to say that, let it, leave it alone to say the whole thing. But since a very young age, I always had to deal with a lot of letters, you know, learning how to write and having to write all these letters. Uh, it really, you know, makes you good on the calligraphy. Um, so design is a huge part of my life. Um, I collect a lot of uh, items, found, found things, and I find a lot of things, and I get a lot of inspiration from everyday life, and I do color code my books. Uh, this uh, was my apartment in New York before I moved to San Francisco. Um, so, how I said, you know, type is a huge, huge part um, of my work, and uh, my approach to type is usually from a curious standpoint, looking at it from uh, not necessarily always like a structure way, but also using it to have fun. Uh, I'm gonna start by showing you some sketches, and it always comes from a very conceptual place. These were some sketches that I did for, um, one of the gourmet books. Um, it was a gourmet. Uh, it was a book about pasta, and the art director that was working on it um, wasn't sure what the design hook was going to be, and I suggested using swatches. And usually, uh, when you know it's an Italian cookbook and you talk about swatches, people think very classic, very kind of something you've seen a million times. And my idea was to, you know, just looking at all these photos of noodles, was to uh, play with swatches and create, custom make them so they would feel like the, um, um, like the pasta. And that's kind of some of my, how I approach design. I think um, usually ideas are very simple. Sometimes they can be very complicated. But just kind of having fun and looking at the shapes. Uh, this was, uh, another instance where um, just kind of playing on the shapes of the typefaces that this magazine used, um, using uh, parentheses to represent seven different men. So, you know, it was like, this was a story about seven men writing about important women in their lives, and I used swashes to kind of represent their mustaches because they were scholars. Um, I also do a lot of... Uh, lettering. Uh, and um, I, I don't consider myself le a letter. It's just something that I do because sometimes you're rushing in order to get something done and it's easier to draw the type than to uh, do research and find it. And sometimes it's, you know, it's a huge, an illustration. I have something in my head, so um, I'll play with the shapes. Uh, this actually, I did it in an airplane on a flight from New York to San Francisco on my trackpad. And the guy who was sitting next to me didn't get up for the whole flight because he didn't want to interrupt me. Uh, this is another sketch. Um, it was for a magazine that got killed uh, because they wanted something swashy. But the idea here was, again, it was about this runner, this girl who just, uh, she's like, she wins everything. Um, you know, so again, a lot of my work can be very small, very based on letter, form as letter forms. 
Uh, sometimes it's just about a page or a story, and sometimes it's really, really big. Um, these are very focused uh, little projects, you know, like this drop cap. It was for a story about, um, it was a fashion story where we shot the, um, the model in the desert, and the name of the story was Desert Rose. And what do you do with something like that, you know? So I just, I created this uh, Tuscan drop cap and I didn't want to just use a regular Tuscan. It needed to feel a little bit more special so it didn't just feel like another uh, wood type. Um, these are my um, design heroes. Um, I have lots and lots of them, but these two women are very, very influential in my work. The first one's Karen Gober. Um, she's, uh, about probably the best type teacher in the world, if you ask me. She taught me how to think, how to think of type in the context of uh, the world we live in. Um, use it as uh, a way to really communicate ideas, not only uh, gray matter on a page. The second one was also Karen's student, and that's Deb Bishop. And Deb Bishop is one of my favorite um, editorial designers. She's in unbelievably amazing, ex extremely smart, and I've, I've learned a lot from her. And she was the first one to allow me to really do work that um, was mine, that to really, she kind of set me loose and let me play with type and uh, play with ideas. Because usually when you're starting in magazine design, you, you get in a magazine and then you're kind of following a set template. So this is some of the work I, I did for More Magazine. Uh, you see that I'm very inspired by Herb Luballen as well. Uh, and the work usually has to do, um, uh, you know, with the story and also um, kind of building from an idea. But what's interesting in this collection of work was that in the work I was be able to do and more was that the type never had to take a secondary um, place to the photography. We really, for the features, we always, the goal was to really work as a poster and get the two talking to each other, where often magazines have, it's the photo and then the type, you know, and the type is just kind of, it's the text. And here uh, we really use type uh, in a way to communicate ideas and again you'd create an opener and then uh, follow through. Uh, this was kind of playing from uh, you know the 18th, a lot of stuff we did was kind of 19th century type and done in a modern way so for this story about pageants I j was just kind of playing with the idea of engravings and you know like the kind of light and how that was represented. This was actually the only uh, certificate that I ever received from the Type Directors Club. Uh, and that year we submitted a lot. And I spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time uh, lettering. Like I lettered every single day. There was a new story. I lettered the front of the book. Um, and this was what well won, which is, was really surprising because it's a lot of white space <laughs> and the type is really small. Uh, and the idea here, like the story was about um, uh, surviving cancer. So there, there were essays, and those are stories are stories that are really, really hard to art. And I used two different typefaces. I combined Affair and um, Miller by Matthew Carter to kind of create this, this craggly uh, sensibility. And you see that it's like, it's italics uh, from uh, Miller and the caps are from um, Affair. Um, and then sometimes, y you know, when you're working at a women's magazine more, it was a magazine for women over 40, you'd get the stories where the headlines were just like really boring. This was a story about, you know, men we love, and I just really didn't want to work on it o at all. And I got the headline, and it, it was, this is the whole deck. Bad boys, nice guys, actors, astronauts, even a prince and a president. Welcome to the more to-do list. If none of these men make your heart pound, then we want to check your for a pulse. And it, men we love, and it's just so uninspiring. But, you know, I was like, well, you know, this is a woman's magazine. Um, 
this is about crushes, so let's just act like a schoolgirl and um, have fun. And to this day, a lot of people reference this work. They, people come out of different places to me and they're like, I love that opener. And I, I'm always surprised by it because I just did not want to work on the story at all. Um, then I worked on uh, this uh, domino box. And this was a, another uh, challenge <laughs> for me. Because Domino was a magazine that, uh, it was a great magazine. The concept behind it was pretty incredible. It was a shelter magazine, and shelter is like um, for your home and decorating and how, uh, you know, how to live your life. And it was the first magazine that said, hey, it's okay. It's okay if your house is messy. Because y until then, all the magazines that were about um, your home and decorating, everything was perfect. You know, like they would even remove um, plugs from the walls because they weren't pretty, you know, like it was just always very, um, you, it didn't feel like your home and it felt like something you couldn't reach, you couldn't live that life. So, but the design of the magazine was something that was just not for me. They used a lot of, of vernacular that um, I didn't identify with. I found, I found it ap apologetic. Uh, they used a lot of grip papers and tape and, you know, like everything. It was very scrapbooky. Uh, so for me, this was an interesting challenge because now I had to kind of redesign it. The magazine folded in 2005. I worked in 2009. And I had to make, sh uh, make sure uh, the magazine still looked fresh and looked like he had, instead of, you know, he just came back from the dead, he had, it was uh, something that was being done now and it would stay relevant. Um, so I did it with type. Um, I think uh, I got a lot of the energy that already existed on the pages and created interesting, uh, interesting textures and worked with um, a lot of white space, introduced some lettering. They used to do a lot of handwriting. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of handwriting. I don't do it well. Um, and I fought in any way that I could to get rid of them. And uh, so just creating really engaging um, layouts. So as a way to feel young and uh, fill the page and make it feel as dense as it used to be, but without the layers um, of, uh, you know, just design elements on the page. This was a story about paint. Uh, this had previously, they would run these as small little charts and grids. Tables, I'm not a huge fan of tables. I think they really kill uh, content. Uh, so I, I decided to do a spread of polka dots. Um, the second edition of Domino, I didn't get away with killing the handwriting. So um, the design director that was overseeing the project, she felt that I really needed to bring it back and that it was a huge part of um, Domino and usually how they used to do would be like this is a closet with a giant arrow pointing to it or things that just to me um, Didn't feel like it was adding any value. So I tried to figure out a way that I could bring the um, Handwriting to it, but in a very minimal way So we did this really big handwriting and this is not mine uh, the I asked the design director who had a really nice handwriting to do it I just get too obsessive about it, and it's just, it never works. Uh, we also did some um, photo shoots for uh, Domino, and there were only two. The budget was teeny tiny, and we had to get really scrappy about it. Uh, that's actually my dog on this photograph. Um, and, you know, just a lot of movement, and I, I always like to make the type work with uh, the photography. So really poster-like and really engaging. These were some of the market pages. These are all pickup images, which if anyone designs for magazines knows that it's very, very hard to work with. Um, and then through the entire package, uh, we had this little uh, system that kind of ran through. And again, I, I always like to, type is extremely important, but also the space around it. and type hierarchy, obviously it's what makes a magazine design. And I tend to, not as a rule, but I tend to work with lots of typefaces. And the reason I do that is because I, s I, not I not, don't always use 
all the weights of a typeface. I will use the bold from one, then a light from uh, a different kind of typeface and just kind of create uh, the textures that feel right to me and really give um, the magazine or the project a voice. So here's how all the sections play out. Then after Domino, um, I went to, I heard that a creative director who I was a huge fan of, um, Scott Dadich, he's always been someone who I always looked up to. He really, renov he really innovated in the area of design um, in the US, but also in the world. He's really well known around the world. Um, he got a job as the editor-in-chief at Wired. When I heard about that, I was like, I have to go work at Wired, whatever it takes. So um, I called Scott and I asked if I could apply for the job. And um, I got hired and we moved to San Francisco. Um, this is, and once, once I got to San Francisco, I was the first hire. There was, you know, magazines go through tr transitions. And it's not uncommon in uh, the US to just kind of bring in new people. So I was hired not as the design director, I was hired as um, the uh, deputy design director. And what that meant was that my job was to lead the design but not do a lot of managing. Because this was my design job, like my dream job, and I wanted to put my head down and work. I didn't want to have to be in meetings all the time. And um, being that I was the first one to get there, uh, in the time of transition, Scott had brought in Margaret Sword. This is Margaret. And Margaret um, used to work for Wired when Scott was creative director. And she was there helping out on the transition. And she was there to give me support, introduce me to Wired. And this was the biggest gift that anyone has um, ever done for me because having, um, a magazine is a very, very complex um, system. It's a very hard project. And when you have to do in a short time, I redesigned Wire twice in the span of a month and a half, and you'll see the uh, project. Um, you need a great team. And this was a period of, of, tr of transition, and um, this redesigns are hard, but also doing redesigning a magazine that is really well redesigned, uh, really well designed, is always a challenge. So um, the first issue I did was the 20th anniversary issue, and it was an encyclopedia from A to Z of everything that it's wired. Um, and this was an amazing way to get started because this basically worked as my brief. Right, like everything that there was to know about Wired was here. I didn't really have to go through 2,000 issues. It just from referencing this and being able to look back at specific things gave me a great introduction. Um, so we kept this actually pretty simple in the inside. Uh, the we, I had to come up with a design that would allow the seven different designers that were working at Wired at the time to uh, be able to work on pages and we had to divide this up and the stories would run into each other. So we worked with on a 12 column grid and we just, uh, in order to make this fit, we would just play with expendable um, column widths. And these were the three column widths that we had to work with. The other thing I did was to develop a whole alphabet which uh, Tim Grunison, who was an amazing um, our director helped me do. And we came up with a unique style to do the flow charts. Um, and we really unified the look by uh, hiring uh, a few illustrators to create art for the whole issue. And, uh, you know, we really had fun. This was like an incredible project to work with because it was a great format. And then uh, the project from once we designed the template was to really break the format and figure out interesting ways to tell stories. And all these pages faced an ad, so the white space around it was really, really important. And also you think about, you know, like not having uh, section openers, it's just A to Z, so you have to keep the reader engaged. So we used a lot of movement and played with sizes. 
Then right after that, we jumped right into the redesign. And um, the, uh, one important thing about the wired redesign was that we needed to have a big concept behind it or we had to have some kind of philosophies because we tell or we told all kinds of different stories. You'd have your regular profile or you'd be taught or there would be a story about politics or there would be a story about history and uh, the span of stories were just really, really wide. So, and Wired um, has always had this tr tradition of kind of trying something different and being innovative and uh, layers, tons of layers. Uh, when Wired was first introduced to the market, they used to smell of ink because there would be so many layers of paint and they used to paint with pen tones and really blast the neon colors. And one thing they're particularly known for was like the orange and the purple orange flood collar with purple type over him. Um, we no longer had PMS collars on the inside, so we would had to find uh, new ways to be innovative or to be, to add layers. Um, and the sections were gonna change. Now, before they used to have parallel sections, they were play, tasks, start play ta and tasks. So all actions, it made sense for them all to go together. Uh, the content was changing, so we had all new sections and they were very different. The name was Alpha, Ultra, Gadget Lab, Info Porn, and Q. So no real relation between them. So we decided, to, and I say we, me, the team, the editor-in-chief, uh, it takes a lot of uh, people to make a magazine come together. Um, we decided that we were gonna play on the idea of uh, multi-dimensional, so things being more than meets the eye. So if you think of uh, quantum uh, physics, uh, the whole theory is that there's multi various scenarios that could be uh, happening at the same time. Um, so this is what this explored, and uh, Carl de Torres, who again was a former art director um, at Wired, created this for us. We asked him to, you know, sketch some ideas. Um, a huge part of my job was again the type voice. What is the family of typefaces that? are gonna, people are gonna identify with us and that we're gonna tell our stories. And each of the sections, since they were different from each other, um, would get their own. So I had to, myself and Margaret, come up with uh, a series of typefaces that um, worked to, were different enough but worked together well. And after tons and tons of type tasks, this is where we arrived. And we felt that we were missing something. We felt that you, as great as these are, uh, they work very well together. There was missing the extra level of so sophistication because we really wanted to add a lev make the magazine a little bit more lifestyle. Because uh, technology is not only just tech, it's part of our everyday life. We wear it everywhere, it's part of our life. My house alone has so many computers and things talking to each other without me, um, doing anything. So it's around you, it's no longer a pixel, and that was an important concept behind the redesign. So I introduced uh, Amboise from Type of Handehi, and this, you think, <laughs> it wouldn't be um, a huge change, but actually no one knew how to, what to do with it. When I presented to uh, the team of editors, actually the editor-in-chief, uh, being that he's an amazing designer, uh, was surprised by the choice, but loved it because he understood. He understood the importance of having something that was slightly more newsy, something that would talk to uh, a female um, audience. And the interesting thing about the adding Amboise was that it, made, it really did make a lot of women identify with it. And I've been told by various sources that uh, women automatically liked where men were like, I don't know, I don't know. But eventually through design and through mixing with um, all the elements on the page, we pulled it off. Um, so this was a very intricate, I mean, look at this. It, it was just really eclectic design and lots of typeface. So in order to pull, out, pull off a, uh, a 
an eclectic design like that, you really need some to set some rules. And we did that by working with a really um, specific grid. For the front of the book, we were going to do a seven column grid to allow us to always have an empty column. And this is how it played out. So all of this, it's important to notice, is in the same, in the same grid. Uh, we also worked with really big headlines because, again, t lots of things happening. Everything was setting caps so that I would quickly uh, see what was a headline and what was copied. So it wasn't like you weren't trying to uh, identify all kinds of um, information on a page. Um, and then all the design elements that we used uh, in this redesign came from this lockup. Because again, it was already so eclectic that we needed to make sure things related to each other. So uh, the square from the letter and the space they used became the identity system for Ultra. This was the culture section. Um, and again, it's just a way to innovate and present new ways of using our grid. And this was really done, again, to set apart the sections and to uh, surprise the readers. This was Q. Q was kind of like what Wired is really known for. It was like how things are made kind of section. So lots of charts. Uh, we decided to start opening always on a um, kind of like a, a little diagram. and. Obviously, to make things more difficult, we decided that we were going to open with this giant queue. So um, even to this day, it's a joke that only I would do something like this, where there is half of the page is a giant drop cap. And these, the first six, the logo was designed by Carl de Torres, and the first six were done by him. And after that, we started to commission them out to different artists. And this is what, how Q looked like. Again, you can see how the empty column image will go through the, that empty column, but never taxed. And then there was Gadget Lab, which is the, which was our like fashion, uh, our, our sexy um, section, where we started to shoe uh, these really cool gadgets in very beautiful, shiny ways. And I, we bought, brought Amboise back, and you see that I, one thing that I love about magazine design and that I try to do in every single thing I do is to make these look more like posters rather than just tiresome uh, pages of uh, copy. So really working around the image. For the features, we usually were very playful and uh, again, very eclectic magazine. So um, we had to avoid bringing new typefaces and we already had so many to choose from so we usually use this as a way to really break out of the seven column grid and uh, to um, explore uh, ways to show information. Um, this was a package about food, processed food, and I actually designed this myself. It was a 22 page package and the idea here was to really base on uh, food packaging without being obvious because I think uh, with Wired, the whole um, idea is that, you know, it, it's really about the, uh, the content and food was not something we did a lot and it would feel out of character to make something feel too precious and being that the idea was processed food, um, I, st I started to add this kind of yellow uh, bars of color right on top of the, of the type to really give you that sense of like a press, a printing press and things being made really quickly. I um, also chose to use this kind of pepto uh pink and if you don't know what pepto is, it's uh, stomach medicine, so if you eat too much you get sick. Uh, color as a flood color is a personal kind of touch and uh, joke inside joke uh, because uh, the whole um, concept be behind this package was that um, you know it's okay to eat processed food now uh, there is a lot of companies making better healthier uh, processed food not that you should make your whole diet from it and this was a simple info infographic breaking down the umami burger 
And how I work is that I usually, as I design, I put a, you know, the layouts on the, on the floor because I like to really work on pacing and make sure that each spread uh, goes together. And I tend to do that for everything I do. I just like seeing things on the, on the floor and be able to gaze from my computer screen to um, everything that came before him. Um, and this was a, another instance where it's just a simple spread and you can see Amboise and how it fits perfectly with an, um, a kind of a di diagram. And this was actually built, this is a live garden that we built and um, we hired a stylist from Martha Stewart to create everything and the items were uh, 3D printed. So a lot, a lot of work went, a lot of work and care went into one spread, for example. Then I went through this phase of um, not by choice making type uh, unreadable, uh, usually conceptually and just kind of, you know, just working from the concept for the shoe and just reacting to the to the image. Uh, this is not my handwriting. This was done by a letter in, from Hawaii called uh, Matthew Tapia, who is excellent. And um, the second instance of unreadable type was this story uh, called Flying Blind. And this was about um, just warfare, the new kind of warfare where who's going to win is the person that can jam uh, the enemy's um, drones and uh, radio, it's all basically radio wave. And the idea was that if it's blind, it shouldn't be readable. The, creative, the current creative director there actually, uh, Dave Moretti, uh, joked about how th this being unreadable but perfectly legible. So concept can sometimes uh, drive the design, can always drive the design, but y you shouldn't let yourself uh, hold back from an idea just because of preconceived ideas of what design should be. Um, hold on, this is repeating a little bit. Hold on, I have to jump because we're gonna run out of time and there's one more thing I wanna show today. Um, so after Wired, Towards uh, the end, uh, we did this special edition called uh, Design Life, and uh, this was my last project there. And it was again, it was similar to Gadget Lab, and we would just uh, showcase some items that we thought we were beautifully designed and that everybody should have in their life. And this was another opportunity that uh, we got to add typography to it. So um, and. How type saved us here was that, you know, the items, we didn't have a budget to create huge sets, and we also didn't have enough uh, items to really create a room, so we used the type as a way to hold this con concept together, to hold all the, pe the random pieces we had for each section. After Wired, I worked on Real Simple. Um, so I left Wired after a year and a half of just working lots and lots of hours. And I was ready to, um, for a new challenge. And uh, Real Simple approached me about doing a redesign for them. And this was also another really uh, difficult challenge because the, creative, the former creative director of Real Simple had retired and she was the person who gave me my first job at the New York Times. So someone who I really, really respected and here's some of the work I did for her. And sh while Karen taught me type, Jenna ta taught me layouts and how to look at positive and negative space. So this was a really important project for me. When I got started, I opened some of their files and this is what I found. They were on a 12, this is no grid shaming, but it's important to show. Um, they were on a 12 column grid, but nothing aligns. You know, like everything is just kind of on top. And that came from just like a uh, editors misbehaving and asking our directors to fit more copy. But what happens is that you should just have a box around then. If your grid is not working for you, your design is not working. 
And this actually made me really, really nervous because I love the grid and I work, um, it's the base for everything I do. So um, I spent, you know, some time trying to figure out how to get the, the, teach the grid to the designers and make it easy. And here's some of the work. Um, you know, Real Simple was really about simplicity, different from Wired, so lots of white space, but simple doesn't mean boring and it doesn't mean, um, you know, straightforward. So I looked for ways to make it uh, beautiful and interesting. And they used to use a lot of uh, design elements, different kinds of rules and arrows, and I really wanted to simplify it. This uh, and one of the decisions that we made for each of the section openers was to create little logos, all the same typeface, but little logos to, again, to set it apart for the reader that this was a new section. And this were done by uh, um, Tao Lemming for me. These were our typefaces. So like I mentioned before, I tend to uh, do lots of type tests and kind of pick the typefaces uh, different textures that kind of complement each other and provide a nice hierarchy and then I stick to them. This was a little um, navigation on the food section and this is it on the grid. So now like, you know, I actually made 150 pages of uh, mock layouts so the designers could see how the grid can work for you. And for text, they were on a 10 column grid and I overlapped uh, image grid with uh, two column gutters so they could quickly design, snap their images to it. And the challenge with Real Simple was that they told all kinds of different stories. It wasn't just reading text. It was pages with products, then there would be pages with lots and lots of text and uh, deep captions. So, um, you know, I had to really kind of create a template that was uh, flexible enough and have enough type styles that would allow for that kind of type hierarchy and kind of save time from the designers because what happened before was that they were spending a lot of time coming up with new type specs every time and it just becomes a, a carnival. Um, here's some of those pages. And I also developed a special unified color palette for them and there was a pretty big uh, color study behind it and that there is a system to it. You can see that there is numbers. So if you pick, decided to go with light pink, uh, there's a combination of how to use the colors. Again, this is me working on uh, the section and here are some simple pages. So lots of white space, um, text and image working together. Um, I advise them to try to stick to simpler shapes, not really busy images. And here is a side to side from Real Simple on a page from Wired. Very different voices typographically, but you can see how that um, from a standpoint of uh, page design, I kind of tend to repeat myself a little bit. And I just noticed that today when I was going through the presentation. This were some of the front of the books. So very journal, like very simple, not huge contrast from the work I did at Wired. Um, I tend to also really like to ask editors to break information from dense copy and do little pullouts because I, I think it helps uh, bring the reader in and also helps break it, break it up, you know, because sometimes you can read an additional piece of information that uh, will catch your eye. This was the guide section before they used to just uh, run a, t a really boring TOC and no one really paid attention to the page. So on the redesign, they really asked me to um, activate this page and make something a little bit more exciting. Um, and again, what made this project great was that I worked with like, great people on it. I did a lot of the design and the type research and it was much more like I worked in San Francisco, traveled to New York, did it, uh, worked in their offices, did, uh, worked on the meetings, but the um, design director at um, Real Simple and the photo director and the editor-in-chief are incredibly talented, have great taste. So um, this project was really about giving them tools and uh, to create a great design and really provide 
more consulting services and they really taking this design and made their own and it looks really great. So this was the food section. They used to do this uh, really elaborate dinner like food sections where they would really set the table with napkins and uh, it took days to shoot it. And um, I proposed that to treat the section more as a package and uh, keep it all against white simpler because the name of the section, uh, the magazine, that's my alarm. <laughs> The name of the magazine is real simple. And that's actually all of it. <laughs> I, almost, I almost did it. <laughs> <laughs>